Okay, sorry, uh, we're a bit late. We expect to take more issues. Welcome as well to the Linguistic uh, Badminton Seminar. I'm very happy today to welcome to introduce uh, Chile Di Tiora. Uh, you probably all know him, at least for those who are at SOAS. Uh, so Che Gagitiora has been a senior lecturer in Swahili at SOAS. For how long now? Uh, quite a while. Yeah. Quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's also a member of the Center of African Studies at SOAS as well. Um, he has quite an impressive academic background, very international. Uh, he studied in Mexico at the University, uh, Universidad Autónoma uh, Metropolitana, uh, in Michigan State University for his PhD. Uh, he taught at El Colegio de Mexico, Boston University and Kenyatta University uh, in Kenya, so quite international background. His areas of expertise are broadly language and culture, but more specifically uh, African languages, uh, about their use, their spread, especially in Eastern Africa. Uh, he's also interested in lexicography and translation from and into Swahili, uh, Kikuyu, it's your native language, Kikuyu. Uh, Spanish and English, and in 2002 you wrote um, dic a Swahili Spanish dictionary, dictionary, which is probably the first one. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also an expert in urban youth languages uh, with <laughs> the study of Cheng, uh, or Shen, Shen, Shen yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is a youth language spoken in uh, Nairobi. And you may talk about it a little. Yes, I will. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah, today is going to explore uh, sociolinguistic issues related to the uh, linguistic situation and landscape, landscape in Nairobi. So the title of Chege's talk is A Match Guys Test Experimental Study of Attitudes Toward Varieties of Swahili and English Spoken in Nairobi. Okay. I leave you the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much, Rosin. And uh, I, uh, for a wonderful introduction and apologies for the delay. There was a slight hitch here. Um, yeah, it worked out. <laughs> right, so, uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, right, that title of my talk, that long title, I think, reveals most of what I'm going to say. Um, it is, you may have come across, you know, those who are studying linguistics or social linguistics, in particular, psycho psycholinguistics, you may have come across a mention of this um, experiment that has been used in several places originally done in Canada, uh, but it has been adapted uh, in various places since then, and with interesting results. So I will explain why I thought this might be a good thing to apply in the case of Nairobi. Right, so uh, a bit of background first. Um, what I'm going to talk about has a lot to do with uh, change in language, lang linguistic change, okay? and. Um, as we all know, at least those who are in linguistics, linguistic change is as inevitable as death, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, languages must change. Languages always change. And there are two main reasons. One being internal reasons. These, there are internal dynamics that uh, bring about changes, for example, in the articulation of vowels, or some consonants may change their quality. Um, but also through contact with other languages. That is also a major reason as to why uh, linguistic change uh, takes place in the system. Uh, in the case of Kenya, with 62 languages and dialects, you can imagine there is quite a lot of contact happening, and therefore there is quite a bit of mutual cross-linguistic influences. These are just examples which um, from lexical innovations, which tend to be the easiest ones to notice. We don't notice grammatical changes as quickly or as readily. We may not even sometimes not quite observe or perceive phonological changes, but when a new word comes in, we, we take notice immediately. So many speakers of Swahili may or will be able to recognize, maybe not chai so much, but they will say, yeah, chai comes from Hindi, although we know it comes from beyond that. Kahawa, some might recognize, comes from Arabic. Uh, computer, you may recognize, comes from English. Uh, maktaba, again, some people might recognize this as an Arabic word, especially if they have, they have a bit of Arabic. Hoteli, hotel, basi, bus, and so forth. So these are easy to notice, but sometimes the other kind of changes are not so easy to notice. Again, very broad background about Swahili. Some of you may be aware of uh, the language spoken by 
about 80 to 100 million people, mainly in East Africa, um, but also Central Africa, DRC, mainly Democr Democratic Republic of Congo. The vast majority of this, the speakers of this language are second, they speak it as a second language with varying degrees of competence. And this point will come up in the later study that I'm talking about. So degrees of proficiency on one hand and also substrate influences will always come into action. The indigenous native Swahili dialects are in great danger, uh, mainly because their speakers are minority groups, even though their language is very big worldwide, but the actual native communities are also uh, endangered alongside other languages, mainly because of the onslaught of standard Swahili, English, and Sheng, and some of them are likely to be dying. Now, there's a view which I want to bring in here because it's relevant to what I'm talking about, that languages can be viewed simultaneously as discrete units or particles, you can list them, language A, B, C, D, L1, 2, 3, 4, or bundles, or it can, the languages can also be seen as bundles of features across time and space, or waves, right, which are best studied in terms of how their variation, right, how degrees of variation, types of variation, and so forth. And this is a kind of very, very interesting for linguists because in a sense, they give us as an idea of ch linguistic change in progress. In other words, because we can't spend thousands of years waiting to see the changes that are happening in language, we have to find other means of trying to anticipate the changes. And one of the ways is through synchronic study of cross uh, variation across uh, dialects of the same language. Another view is to see language as part of a larger eco ecological matrix or field where the functional roles and usage of linguistic codes for a wide range of purposes are more in focus. And here we have a couple of examples. I would say Arabic and Chinese offer this type of uh, arrangements where you have very many distinctive varieties of Arabic versus what might we call the standard Arabic, which also depends on the country. So you might have Moroccan standard Arabic or Egyptian standard Arabic and so forth. Same thing with the Chinese, multiple Chinese languages which only share a common written form. So this is one view of language which I would like to, uh, to see, uh, to use, and introduce this idea of micro languages, um, which captures all those things, that we look at language as comprised of waves of features that extend across time, geography, and space. And these different varieties of the same language, of the same macro language, uh, play different roles in different domains, at least in the case of Kenya. And so, Sheng, Kenyan Swahili and standard Swahili or Swahili Sanifu for those who understand the language. These are three different varieties of the same language as part of the macro language which extend all the way outside of Kenya into Tanzania, into Democratic Republic of Congo where you have all other different kind of varieties of the same language. The key thing is that speakers and others recognize this as Swahili but the variation can be quite uh, 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 big. And so I want to look at Swahili in a sense as a macro language. Um, because sometimes the degree of divergence between some of the ways of speaking understood as Swahili, sometimes they go beyond dialect. You know, words, sometimes the differentiation is fairly extreme to the extent that you might start thinking about a different uh, uh, language. So the coastal varieties of Swahili, for example, in southern Tanzania and northern Kenya are geographical. They are regional and these are native speaking communities. These are not, they're also part of the micro language, but they will be of less focus uh, in this particular talk. But the social variations and the other regional ones are of more interest in my view, especially those ones that are in contact with many other different languages of the, of the region. So in Indubil is one documented, spoken in DRC by, you know, again, youth language and so forth, and Sheng in Kenya, somewhat comparable, uh, but also with their own uh, uh, slight differences. And of course, the wider re regional or national agrupations are also of very much interest to me because they now take shape as Tanzanian, Kenyan, or Congolese Swahili. And speakers can immediately, or, well, you know, generally, 
they recognize each other as such. Oh, that sounds like Congolese Swahili. Oh, that sounds like uh, Tanzanian Swahili. Oh, that's definitely Kenyan or something like that. So there this mutual recognition, and this is what I want to explore a bit more. These are just tools of analysis, speech community, I'm sure you're aware of all that. <clears throat> Norms and values, okay? So this is important because it's not just understanding and knowing the rules of grammar of Swahili. It is also about the rules of communication within a particular speech community of, let's say, Kenyan Swahili or Tanzanian Swahili or DRC Swahili. In other words, a speech community <coughs> must be defined slightly beyond simply the language that one speaks. The English you speak out here in, in, in London may not may identify you easily as a non-member of a speech community, let's say, for example, in Liverpool, even though you're speaking the same language, but the rules of talking, pronouncing, maybe gesturing even, and so forth, might do that. And this is what we use as a basis for defining a speech community or community of practice, which is a term that is increasingly uh, more in use. But speech community, uh, as defined by Del Himes way back in the 1960s, uh, I still find it quite uh, useful to use. Right. So this idea of vernacularization of Swahili is what I'm going to explore a bit more because um, it's where Kenyans in this particular case seek a national identity through the use of Swahili while at the same time retaining an ethnic identity. And this interesting play is what I want to examine a bit more. How does one retain, remain how, how does one express their own ethnicity in Kenya while at the same time speaking a national language such as Swahili or even English for that matter, but somehow retain elements of that identity? And I'm going to argue that this is done mainly through language. So, I dare talk about Kenyan Swahilis, right? Here we are. So, several distinctive and recognizable varieties which also serve as markers of identity. And I'm talking about native Swahili dialects, we know the names like Kimvita, spoken in Mombasa Island, Kiamu, spoken on Lamu Island, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 and a few other dialects of the, of the region that we might talk about, Kibajuni and so forth. Um, then we have what I'm calling vernacularized Swahili, which is recognizable through by its substrate or mother tongue influence. Okay? So, Somebody speaking Swahili, you can tell maybe their first language simply by the way they speak their Swahili. Not, not terribly unusual. Sheng, now uh, of much interest in recent times, uh, is a growing urban Swahili-based vernacular largely associated with the youth. But of course, this idea of youth languages is becoming a bit contentious, especially when now you find uh, people who cannot really be defined as youth <laughs> speaking the so-called youth language, then what do you do? If a 50-year-old is speaking Sheng, are you going to insist that this is a youth language? I don't think we should. In any case, maybe you'll agree with me, age is just a number, yeah, so. Right, um, and then of course we have what we call, what I call educated Swahili, good Swahili, Kisanifu, standard Swahili, which we teach you here at SOAS and elsewhere. The standard book, the book that you have, the, 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 the Swahili that is in the dictionaries, the Swahili is in the textbooks, where, you know, and that's, you know, we, the formal variety which uh, we all know. Now, most Kenyans are able to navigate between some of all these varieties which exist on a sort of a continuum, continuum quite uh, uh, easily. And they mark, the, these Swahilis are marked lexically, structurally, and even in prosody. Intonation, stress patterns are different when one is speaking Sheng as when they're speaking Swahili. For example, Sheng has a way of lengthening the final syllables in ways that Swahili does not. So you can say, well, that, Swahili, that word, it may be Swahili, but you're pronouncing it in Sheng, for example. Right, a few examples, things have changed, you know, uh, maybe those who are in the class, <laughs> those who are taking Swahili, they have been taught Hujambo, and you say? Sijambo, right? Or if I say Habarigani. Nzuri san, okay. I don't think I've taught you to say Psasa. Okay, which is like, what's up? Yeah. Mambo. Maybe you've heard that if you've traveled around East Africa. But these are now fairly, what was very informal greetings by youth 10, 15, 20 years ago. 
you know, including the president is talking that way, for example. So it's no longer very much used. So these have been changed. There are a lot of changes in dynamics. I may not go into full detail today, but uh, that's part of it. So I look at Swahili in this way. Kenyan is in Kenya. Okay. There's a little dot there called Sanifu, standard, sitting in a sea of all these variations of ways of speaking Kenyan Swahili. That's the way we see it. And so I'll be talking about that gray area, largely, not the blue one, which is already nicely fixed in the textbooks and dictionaries and so forth. So I look at it in a little bit that what I mean by a continuum, a concept that we use a lot in, linguistics, in social linguistics anyway, where you're not talking of black or white. You're talking about some kind of possibility of movement along a continuum right, of speeches. So, we are not always stuck on one part here of the standard Swahili. No, even in ordinary speech, in a, in a converse, short conversation, one can easily move back and forth along that continuum. So the idea of a continuum is useful because it does not set stark boundaries, which then limit us from uh, exploring more things. So let's jump into the, uh, the topic more properly, language attitudes. Uh, these are important. They are part of a communi community's linguistic culture and they should not be ignored. That's Fassold saying that. Um, people develop the ability to identify a language and make associations which are derived from the surrounding environment, culture, and society. So these attitudes are culturally informed. And very importantly, they can congeal into stereotypes. Okay? Now, attitudes can also be good indicators of social stratification of language, and they are relevant to a nation's planning of language and educational policy. You know, we cannot create good policy if we ignore the dynamics of this land. And this has happened in many countries of Africa, in fact, that the reality is ignored in favor of an idealistic okay, a program, linguistic language program, which 40, 50 years down the line proves not to, be, to have been the right one. There's an example, we have, we have many examples, including Kenya, Morocco, and others. So in order to test this hypothesis of attitudes, I conduct this much guys test, which is well known, and I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, now. But before I do that, let me just, before I leap into Nairobi, have a quick look at that article, because it talks, it's also talking about stereotypes, but they're not Kenyan or Swahili stereotypes. Maybe one second to have a look at that. I have highlighted what I think are key words that are relevant to the discussion today. So it's an opinion column in a, in a local newspaper here in the UK, which caught my attention. It's quite not too old. It's in July, during this summer. And it caught my attention because it was talking about things that I am trying to research about in faraway Kenya. And the key words here, diversity, that you can translate that into multilingualism or multidialectalism. That's what really this, this, is this person talking about. Uh, they are talking about prejudices. I've just mentioned stereotypes. I've just mentioned about things, ideas that people have in their mind. That's prejudice, prejudging. Uh, there's this new word for me, region of Burr, okay, whatever that means. But I understand that to mean a characteristic way of speaking English in a particular region of the United Kingdom. We know the word thick, we know uh, where Stockport is, but now we can see a distinctive Stockport accent. We can see the words like northerners, we can see words like hybrid accent. Okay? We can see this long sentence there which caught my attention because it appears in Nairobi again. This person, gave the, I gave the clear impression that those I am meeting have mistaken me for the man who has come to clear out their drains. Why? Because of the way he spoke. And then he's finally added it, the polished clip for performers who offer very little else. Why? And the last question, very, uh, very interesting. Who says that our leaders are not allowed to sound as though they should be blah, 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 if that's exactly how their constituents sound? In other words, this person is asking, why do we expect people to speak differently than how they speak you know, in, uh, uh, to others. So this will come relevant, and I brought it here today just uh, for that. So back to the, uh, um, um, the uh, Match Guys experiment. Started out in, in Canada. It was a study of bilingualism. 
right? Immersion schooling led to, you know, because of the division between uh, the Quebec province, uh, province and the rest of Canada, so you have two languages. It's a bilingual country, French and English. And there has always been a bit of a tension between the two, uh, and the bilingual schooling system took effect, and people wanted to understand how this is happening. What, what's, what's the result? What's coming out of that? And in this study, both English and French subjects ranked English guises. I will explain what guises are in a minute. Um, although each group differed in other in, in, in ways, in other ways, okay. But there was consistency from both groups on the higher ranking of English voices. Just call them voices, the guises, right? The recorded voices on those traits. But French speakers were were judged by French subjects, okay. Uh, very highly on elements such as religiosity, kindness, sociability, okay, and so forth. Now, following this study, um, uh, it was adopted for many other, other situations, in, especially in North America, in looking at Spanish versus English or Chicano English and so forth. Um, so, uh, let me, I don't know. I want to explain how this works. Um, okay, it's very simple. You, you have a recording, okay? Yeah, let, let's look at this one. You, the very, some of the, the early, the, the first Canadian was simply testing voices in English and voices in French, okay? But you have the same person reading out those things whatever passage it is, or whatever statement they're making. But once the judgment has, has been made, all right, how does that French-speaking person sound to you? So it sounds très religieux, très this, you know, very this and that. They will say they, what they feel, that voice is telling them. Notice there's no face involved here, okay, at, at, at this point. Now, once you put a face to the, French, uh, to the French voice, and you have a face to the English voice, then in the next stage, you switch them around without letting the participants know. And then you ask them again, what do you think of this English voice, and what do you think of this French voice? And amazingly, as you can see with the, with the, with the other ex experiments with African-American -America, children white, and, and white children, um, the voices were still judged in the same way, right? Okay. People were basing themselves on the language, on the manner of delivery, not the face or the speaker behind that himself, okay? This will become a bit more clear. It has been applied to a, a Welsh study, which I also find quite interesting. And among the conclusions of the Welsh study was that speaking in Welsh can create solidarity among the Welsh speakers, but more importantly, that a Welsh-accented English is an important marker of identity of a Welsh person, okay? And that the RP pronouncing person uh, is sometimes uh, seen as alien or as standoffish and so forth. Um, in the case of Norway, again, I'm just going through some of these uh, uh, studies uh, that have been in the past. In the case of Norway, they wanted to find out how people react to different accented Englishes spoken by Norwegians. Quite a lot like what I'm doing in the case of Kenya, because what I'm looking at is how do people react to different Swahili accents, okay? as second language speakers, not as native speakers. So here in the same way, the, the researchers wanted to find out how do people react to a Norwegian speaking with a British accent, for example, as opposed to one speaking with an American accent. Now, these things are important. As you know, in places as far away as Japan, there, is a debate, there, is, there are studies and experiments and policies that are based on an understanding of how people react to British English or American English. And in some cases, you find that one is preferred to the other. Anyhow, this also was another example, is another example of, um, uh, of, of this kind of uh, study. And so, what they found, very interestingly, is that um, contrary to what they thought at first, if you look at point, bullet point number two, that a Norwegian accented accent, at least in their conclusion, was not a turn-off 
right? Norwegian accent on English. In other words, a Norwegian speaking with a, you know, with a heavy accent, as we say colloquially, was not necessarily seen badly. Apparently, this is what was thought before. So the study showed that actually this is not the case. And that uh, on the other hand also, it does not necessarily make you sound nicer when you speak with a Welsh accent, etc., etc. So these are just a brief uh, looking at the, those results. So let me talk about the Nairobi test itself. Um, it's, the idea is to gain the true feelings of Kenyans about their languages, right? What do they actually think when they hear somebody speaking Swahili with an X kind of accent, okay? As usual, ethics were involved, so I, everybody was, uh, there's no deceptions here involved, and, uh, but obviously, you know, there's a kind of a trick, if you want, because people are not really aware of all that I am doing, okay? <coughs> However, it's not unethical, because it's not interfering at all in any of the, uh, any way. And informing them also, in some cases, when I did, we didn't seem to affect their willingness or ability to, to do the judgment. And so, um, I selected, um, I obtained a professional voice artist, actually a well-known personality, radio personality, and I'm afraid that that drive is not working well. I would have played a few more because they are on that particular drive. Um, but I got this man to record 10 different voices, okay, in these ways, in what, we, what I call Kenyan English, as defined by variously. Of course, now we are talking of different Englishes because, again, just like the Swahili, it's not very difficult if you're Kenyan to recognize a fellow Kenyan when they're speaking English. There are peculiarities of the, of, of the way we speak English. You can, you can tell. You can tell a Ugandan. Okay? You can tell a Tanzanian, more or less. You know? And so it's not unusual. You know, these things, they, they are there. And so Kenyan English does exist, as Kenyan Swahili does as well. So he recorded in Kenyan Swahili, in Shang, in Kiswahili Sanifu, and he's very good, by the way, he's very, you know, well, he's a professional, you know, he's, he's, he, he, he's in a studio, and um, again, I could show a few pictures, but it's not working here. And then, he recorded in these vernacular Swahilis, all right? And I selected these particular languages for various reasons, obviously. Number one, their, their size also, but also their ubiquitous, ubiquitousness in the city. They are very, very present in the city. Gikuyo, Luo, these are the main languages and main ethnic groups of Kenya. Actually, all of these except the Maasai and the Somali to an extent. Okay. But even though Maasai and Somali are minority, they are proportionately well represented in Nairobi. Partly because Nairobi is located where Maasai country is, so it's in their home, literally. And Somali because many of them are urban you know, people, and so they, they're into urban activities like business, you know, and so forth. So there are a lot of Somalis in Nairobi uh, as well as uh, these other groups. Uh, and now I had a team of, obviously, in my research, there are some people helping us, very, very good people, but these were involved in a separate project, not in this particular uh, recording. And so what I, I got him to record was this text, and I really uh, disappointed if we can't listen to some of this. It will be... Let's see if, Oh no, I mean the, the, oh here they are, sorry. Okay, good. So, the guises are here, right? So the idea is that my respondents will listen to these voices without knowing. And it didn't always fully work out. Some people, uh, some respondents figured out that, hmm, that sounds like the same guy, actually, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, but mostly they didn't, and those who did, uh, they were uh, kind enough and polite enough not to show, and it didn't matter very much really, because their views were not really affected by that knowledge. In any case, I did explain to some of them that, look, look this is an experiment, and you, know, uh, you will hear different voices. Some could figure it out. Others actually did not figure out that it was the same person doing this, this thing. So, um, I, in, uh, it's, I actually, I presented a little bit of this in Nairobi about a month ago. And it, because it was a very different audience, it was very interesting because what I did was I played all this, and the audience, we spent about 40 minutes <laughs> discussing them because they became sort of part of the experiment now. 
because it is very clear and obvious. You know, and if you, some of you also may be familiar with uh, different ways of speaking in Kenya, you might recognize that. But that was the beauty of it, I thought, because the people could hear, oh, no, 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 that must be. And then there was a bit of argument and so forth. But listen to one of them, if we get voice on this. It's on mute. Sorry. Okay, let me play that again. Um, maybe I should play, let's see, the, um, the English one first for your benefit, yeah? So you know what it's all about. Life here in Nairobi is really tough. I think 90% of people in Kenya are those who rent their houses. Some of you landlords should not forget that you need tenants so that you can be happy. Remember, no man is an island, and no man stands alone. In particular, those who live in the same plot as their tenants are the worst, and they are the meanest. The ones that really make me angry are those who think their plots are special, that they don't want women, and they don't want the people who want children. When she asks if a room is vacant, the landlord starts to ask stupid questions. Like, first of all, are you married? That child on your back, whose is it? And your husband, where, where does he work? What does he do? Another one says it's a vacant room, but having a child spoils it for her because he doesn't rent to people with children. Some of you landlords need to stop being stupid. Okay. So it, it's a really short extract, which I did not create. I actually obtained it from a, a column in, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, weekly magazine called The Nairobian. And it's a very interesting magazine because it is the first one to recognize Sheng, right, and Swahili and English as the languages of Kenya. So they're publishing in, th in the three ways. So they have a column in very good standard Swahili, written by, an, you, know, you know, and on top of that, they always have one in Sheng, written by a very well-known radio and TV personality who has made his name from simply from Sheng language by starting up a radio station, or not himself, but being hired as one. And so anyhow, I, I selected that article for several reasons. First, it resonates very easily with the Nairobians, you know, because the question of rent and, you know, bad housing and, you know, bad landlords, it's, it's emotive and always it's good when you're doing linguistic study to, to, to bring out a topic that brings out excitement, you know. And it did, actually, because people, like, shake their heads and, and feel bad about these landlords. Um, so that was one uh, reason, because he has many columns talking about you know, social commentary and various things. Um, secondly, um, I did not have to create, you know, something that is, you know, uh, stilted, that is not really running well. So I thought this would. At the same time, I also wanted to have a sort of a standardized pace, you know, that did not involve too many, let's say, hesitations or backtracking or things like that. And therefore, this worked out very well because A, it's published, and B, it can be easily read out by the speaker and so forth. So he read that in those 10 different ways. I don't know if uh, you'd like... So the first one was Sheng, and if you recognize that, you might... I think 90% here is a Kenyan, you are educated. Landlord, I think a Kenyan, you are a Okay, so that, that's basically uh, the text. Uh, you, you've listened to it. It's in English here. And um, um, so it's in these three languages. Now, and then in these uh, in this different ways. So I subjected this to uh, a variety of, of people. Okay. And... Um, you know, uh, younger students, younger, younger kids, and then adults. And among the results of that, uh, here's that. I will not go into much detail because of time. So here are some of the uh, findings that uh, uh, came out of this particular uh, experimentation. Um, I mean, what I did was I encouraged them to give, you know, you can see we are listening in a group. I would play on, on my 
laptop and uh, I have an external speaker, quite loud, you know, nice and loud, and I would get the teachers to give me a room, a spare room in the, in the school. Um, and, um, and then we would, I, would I, I worked in groups of five because working individually, you know, each one of those is about a minute and a half long. Okay, times 10, right? And then the questioning, the, you know, filling up. If you did it individually, very, very long and tedious, which is fine if I had all the time in the world and also if the teachers allowed me to stay in the school all the time for hours on end and interrupt their classes and so forth. So I opted to do it in groups of five and then I would encourage them to respond and give back feedback with, you know, we sort of a little session together in, in, in groups of five. So I encourage them to give the shortest description possible of, the, of each voice such as this one, you can see. Very short adjective, like good, sincere person, and so forth. And so here, here, here is what we are looking at here. What I asked these kids, what, we, after we played the Sheng one, I asked them, how does this sound like? Okay. And these are the responses. Oh, they will say, oh yeah, definitely he's tall. You see the, the interesting thing about this thing. People make judgments about physical looks based on a voice. And it's amazing that the entire group agreed that he must be tall, yeah? But he's not very honest, you know, he doesn't sound very honest, okay? Not so smart, okay? No, 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 he's not a leader, no way, that, we're not going to follow this guy. But very sociable, yeah, sounds like a nice guy, yeah? No, he doesn't go to church, nope, 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 I don't think so. And yeah, he's quite self-confident, and he's a courageous fella. You know, that Aesio Gopa is, means he's not afraid, he's fearless. And, and definitely, you can, you know, they, they, yeah. Occupation, what do you think he does? Ah, this guy is a hustler. Okay, he's probably, <laughs> he probably sells scrap metal. That's one of them says, yeah, one of the, one of the respondents. But the Kenyan Swahili guy, first of all, is seen as a bit older. He's about 25. Ah, don't ask me how they judge the age, all right? And don't ask me how they decided the English speaker is about 28. Okay, but the Swahili speaker, Kenyan Swahili speaker, the first comment is, ah, he does, his Swahili is not very good. <laughs> so there's an implicit recognition that, oh, Kenyan Swahili is different and is not great, you know, unless you're speaking, you know, in a, you know, in a formal situation. But the informal setting, Kenyans will speak in a different way. Not to say that they can't, you know, they don't know how the standard language. Um, he's tall. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's quite honest. Intelligent, yeah, uh, the leader, yes. Why? Most leaders they see on TV and MPs and ministers, they speak either Swahili or English. So yes, if you speak Swahili or English, you can be a leader. That's what I'm extra extrapolating. Remember, the conclusions that I will read out to you here, they are not really what they said. It's about what I extrapolate from their discussion. And that's important to remember. So, um, I would ask respondents to clarify an answer. Did you mean he sounds tough? All right, for example. Uh, and also engaged in brief discussions about a particular point or response. I also paid attention to non-verbal language, including hand gestures and facial expressions. There was a lot of snickering, a lot of laughing, a lot of, you know, you know the kids, you know, they saying to each other, hey, listen, you know, laughing, you know, sort of hiding, you know, the, all those things were meaningful because they would give some idea of what's going on. Even if they give different responses, I, you know, I sort of try to judge which, what would be which. So, what do the female, young females th uh, think about um, these uh, guises? The first thing I found was Sheng speakers are understood to be young, on average 19 to 20. They are sociable and self-confident, but they are not very religiously inclined. They are not seen as honest or intelligent and have only secondary school level of education. Sheng speaking man is courageous and he's a hustler as well. Kenyan, Swahili, and standard Swahili speakers are evaluated as of the same age, slightly higher than the Shang speaker, but they are both honest, and the speaker is, but the Kenyan Swahili speaker is not as intelligent as the standard Swahili speaker, according to their responses, okay? So, you, again, these are interesting judgments. Um, uh, but perhaps the most interesting observation is that teenagers found the standard Swahili speaker very eloquent for having a sweet language, all right? While the Kenya, speak, Kenya Swahili speaker is viewed as not fluent in the language itself, thus making a clear line of understanding between native and fluent coastal speaker uh, of, of a grammatically correct Swahili with all the relevant intonations and the broken Swahili that typifies 
Kenyan Swahili. So very easy to recognize that. Finally, the Kenyan Swahili speaker is, has leadership abilities. Again, not surprising. Our leaders uh, uh, mainly converse with us in, in Kenyan Swahili. So it's easy to make that association that there's a leadership. Right. Um, right. Now, another group here, uh, let's see. The, um, the other interesting thing was that the young female teenagers evaluate all vernacular Swahili speech samples as unsophisticated. What is that? Um, yes, here, this group here was very keen to indicate. In every case, they just listened to that and they would start laughing. Ah, you know, mshamba. Mshamba in Swahili, it means, you know, you know, you know what it means. It means upcountry bumpkin, somebody who is unsophisticated, you know, from out there in the bush. Each one of them, without, you know, without favor, favoring any of these. So there is clearly the vernacular Swahili is associated with a rural area, with a countryside. Not unsurprising. Um, Right. Um, none of them is seen to have more than secondary school education, and most are primary school leavers, right? So again, the level of education is captured by the way the person speaks. He can't have gone beyond secondary primary school if they are speaking that Kenyan Swahili. Interesting that um, stereotypically the Maasai, the Luo, and the Somali are imagined as tall. Very interesting, because once the, the Somali guys came on, for example, or the Maasai one, ah, they would just say, oh, that guy must be tall. Well, as I said earlier, stereotypes about, you know, and it's true, you know, you know many Maasai and many Somali people are tall, but obviously it's, you, you shouldn't be able to tell that just by listening to a voice. So we are talking of stereotypes that are transmitted through language. Um, and Gikuyu and Kamba speakers are understood to be short. Such me, okay. Um, Kamba, Luya, and Somali are understood to be honest, but there is a, a hesitation and divided opinion about Kikuyu and Luo speakers. Overall, none of the speakers are seen to be outrightly intelligent, but there is no doubt about their sociability and self-confidence, which are seen to be very high. Um, there is, again, about character that you, you, very interesting stuff, like the Luo speaker likes to fight. You know, some, some respondents were saying that, he likes to fight. The Gikuyu one is funny, whatever that means, okay? Um, the occupations are also illuminating about the socioeconomic division of labor roles and the trades as understood by Nairobi teenagers. So it's very, very clear that the Gikuyu speaker, whether he's, an, he's either unemployed or, you know, pushes some kokoteni, a, uh, you know, uh, sells things on the street. He's a street vendor, basically, according to the stereotype of the voice, okay? Um, the Luo speaker, is many thought, oh, he would say, oh, he must be a border border, um, uh, uh, um, you know, you know, border border is a motorcycle taxi. So just listen to the voice, say, oh, that guy must be a border border, <laughs> you know, t you know, taxi uh, taxi driver. The Kamba is a shoemaker. So just by listening to the voice, the speakers will say, oh yeah, most likely a shoemaker. Right. So again, we are looking at stereotypes associated with different trades. And of course, we know there is an ethnic division of labor of sorts uh, for historical and other cultural reasons, perhaps. The Somali man is straightforwardly imagined to sell either in a clothes shop, right, or sells camels, right, or mira. Mira is the, the, the cat, which is very popular with uh, many people in Kenya and, and Somali in particular. But he may also own a hotel, which in Kenyan English means actually a cafe. If you go to Kenya, don't ask, <laughs> someone invites you to a hotel, you're going to a cafe to eat some food, yeah? <laughs> so that's Kenyan English for you, okay, right? Right, and so forth. So now, uh, I know time is running, but uh, a couple more slides. Uh, which are now older people. These are university, I, I, these are, some of these were from the university, uh, University of Nairobi, others are from Kenyatta University, others I, you know, I group, I pull off, off on the streets. And so this was also interesting um, that um, a couple of interesting differences is that first of all, these grown-ups, they actually filled out the forms themselves, not as I did with the kids. So they, 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 we sat in a group, uh, but they would listen and they a I asked them to fill out the questionnaire. So that's a, a bit different because in a, in a sense, it's more accurate in a sense because they can actually say more 
they can exp you know, expand on, on, on little things here and there. Ideally, this experiment should be done in a laboratory with headphones, every individual with their you know, sheet of paper. You listen to the 10 voices and you make your remarks. I did not have a laboratory. I did not know how to take people you know, out in the, to a laboratory. So this is my improvisation in this particular case. So it's experimental in that sense. But interesting, uh, therefore we obtained a, a more personalized profile of responses. Um, interestingly, two of the students at the university that were in one of the groups, one of them was from Zambia and spoke Bemba. The other one was from Nigeria and spoke Hausa. But they still had very, inter very interesting opinions about it. They are studying there, so they've been living there for a few years. And so they have already internalized those, those things. Five minutes, thank you. Right, um, so most of them labeled the Sheng voice as that of a matatu tout, you know, the public minibuses, which are sort of rough sometimes. Some of them, the young men are associated with a lot of things, and so most of them were associate Sheng with that language. Um, but again, just like the others, the, uh, they indexed these vernacular varieties of Swahili to various trades. Not, not any professional, not professionals. The vernacular Swahilis were all indexed to small, petty trade. Not university work, not, not uh, accountant, not a creative, not, not an office job guy not a cyber cafe uh, owner or operator, no, farmer, uh, mitumba, and so forth. On average, the average the age they started was 25 for Sheng, higher than the teenagers, but Sheng was negatively evaluated in general, except um, that all of them agreed about it having high self-esteem. Uh, again, the Sheng is not a very good leader, he's arrogant, he's unreliable, but frank and opinion, opinionated and so forth. Um, Kenyan Swahili speakers uh, are also positively evaluated, except that they are not seen as very great readers, uh, uh, leaders. Now, these uh, opinions given by fairly mature adults working on uh, either undergraduate or postgraduate degrees offered uh, an interesting repertoire, a wider repertoire of vocab descriptive words. You know, obviously they have more vocabulary, so they were able to use words, you know, words like rugged or shaggy or arrogant or free spirit, you know, words that are more, uh, more descriptive. Right, and so, uh, and interestingly, some of them, at least one respondent, opined that the voice of, on the tape of the Shang speaker must be a very dark-skinned person. Ask me how. How do you tell somebody's skin color by, you know, an African, that is, <laughs> by the voice they speak? So, it's, it's, it's quite revealing of very, very many things. Um, in the interest of time, let me just uh, draw some uh, conclusions, ob observations. That most Nairobians have a positive attitude towards Swahili. That Swahili is widely accepted in many registers, but the same cannot be said of any of the other Kenyan languages of Kenya. But also, many see Kiswahili as difficult. This is a textbook Swahili that is shoved down their throats in the classroom, which is in the, the main national newspapers, which, and so forth. And Usually, people just want to have an easier time in life, isn't it? They just want to speak, you know, as easily as possible, not as if they're in a classroom or in a lecture like this one. Um, many people also believe that the best or even the only way of expressing nationalism is through Swahili. Nobody said that we should speak English to become more Kenyan or that we should speak other languages to become more Kenyan. Swahili still is seen as that. But of course, English is still seen as the best language for upward mobility. And in some, Nairobians have attitudes and feelings, even beliefs about their own languages and those spoken by others. For example, Dolwo sounds nice or sweet. These are quite commonly, I came across this. Luo is one of the Nilotic languages of the uh, western part of Kenya. Uh, and and you know, many also say, oh, Somali is difficult, okay, and so forth. Now, these, uh, uh, I think about attitudes, uh, you may ask yourself, what is it all about? Well, we can tell many things. First of all, reveal the motivations, for example, of learning L102. One of the most amazing things I, found in, I find in Kenya is that hardly anybody um, consciously goes ahead to learn another Kenyan language. They might acquire it along the way because they live in certain areas also, but very few people go. And so, why is that so? 
You know, is it because of these attitudes? Is it because nobody, somebody doesn't want to sound like a peasant? Doesn't someone want to sound like, you know, whatever attitudes are being revealed? So they can help us understand this and inform a policy. The status of language and the status of the speakers. You know, so we can now talking about of a high variety of Kenyan Swahili and a low variety of it, which is the ordinary one spoken on the street. And the difference can be quite large now. And so we have to question us the standard itself. What are we doing by giving news, reading news on the radio and television in a language that maybe the gap is you know, so big that maybe the ordinary person actually cannot follow what you're saying in a standard national language? This I have seen happens, at least from literature. I understand this happens also in many Arabic-speaking countries. Um, we can see questions of language shift, is if it's happening, not necessarily in this particular one, but also the question of loyalty to languages, the affective filter, and um, what do people then feel? This particular example, I, I, I was intrigued because there was one girl I remember very much who, uh, uh, when, we, when I played one of the voices, which was the voice of the, her first language, Luya, uh, I didn't know that at the first, but the others just burst out laughing and looking at her. And almost, you know, sort of, she didn't, sound, she didn't look upset, but she was also smiling back and also like, and so I, I, I dug up a bit more. I said, why, 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 what's, 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 what's so funny? Oh, she's Luya. Yeah. So I wasn't too sure what, you know, how, you know, yes, how to interpret that. Okay, is it a good thing or a bad thing? How does this person, individual feel being pointed at? Why are people laughing? Okay. Why she, was she, has, and by the way, she was also very harsh, you know, in, in, in describing the Swahili accented with her own mother tongue. And so it's very interesting what these kind of attitudes and feelings do to the speakers themselves, especially the minority language speakers. How do, how do they feel being singled out? And of course, these uh, kind of attitudes can help us avoid the law of unintended consequences because a lot of resources are wasted and no change in the result. I've just, I've just been studying the, a similar issue uh, in the case of Morocco. And sure enough, after 50 years of pursuing a, a, a policy of Arabization, they have reached a conclusion that that's not the right thing to do. That actually, they are alienating a very large group of people that the two have not quite met, and that English and French maybe offer even more possibilities. So that's 50 years down the drain. Now, in the case of Kenya, Swahili has been compulsory since 1984 in, in secondary schools. How much have we achieved on that? That's a question I would like to know. If we still have this kind of attitudes towards Swahili and to the vernaculars, what is the meaning of a policy, an expensive one too, okay, if it's not producing results or the desired results? The results maybe were not an anticipated. One of the, the reasons why a lot of younger generation people, the millennials in particular, they are neither into English, high English or high Swahili, rather they want Sheng, which is sort of comes in between the two. And this is why such a magazine or, or newspaper becomes a lot more successful than the Swahili only newspaper. And that's why uh, comics such as this one, very good creative stories, very good uh, uh, graphics, but guess what? It's all in standard Swahili. And guess what? It didn't last a year in the market. Today, there are lots of Shang magazines and they're doing quite well. So you can see what I mean, that um, we may be actually focusing on one thing, but actually we should be focusing on the other. All right. Also, attempts to eradicate or to correct the youth, what the young people when they're speaking bad Swahili, they backfire, so forth. Okay, that's right. I think uh, final, the very final point is simply that uh, the Kenyan Swahili raises questions about the diachronic effect on the official languages, on English and Swahili. I should say here the, the, the Sheng question, right? What, what is it doing to Kenyan English and what is it doing to Kenyan Swahili? A lot of interesting things because if you look at the structure, we'll see many other things. Kenyan varieties of Swahili and English are gaining acceptability. Nobody is saying, no, let's not talk that. They may evaluate it a bit low, but they are accepted. Now, in my view, understanding and being aware of variation can help us to teach and learn the standard variety better. When I talk to the teachers, 
and they are all up in arms. No, no, no we don't want to hear that thing. And I say, look, why, can you use a text like the one I showed you right here to correct the grammar, to help the students see this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is how you do it. In my view, um, uh, this can be done, it will be done elsewhere. Finally, maybe all these little changes that may be seen in Sheng in particular can help us sort of predict the future of where it's going. So, standards for healing Kenya, how real is it? I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Chege. Thank very inspiring you. talk. Mm -hmm. I have many little questions, but yeah, okay. I'll give the floor to you yeah. guys. Sorry, Somewhere I had to rush a little bit because you know, yeah, we started a bit late. We have uh, 15, 15 minutes, yeah. yeah. I, I guess one of the reasons why you use recorded voices is that you kind of take yourself out of the experiment a bit, right? Yeah, so, so, say that again, sorry? So one of the reasons why you would use recorded voices is that you take yourself out of the experiment a bit, yeah, right? yeah. less involved. But I, I'm wondering whether um, whether you still have an idea of how they judged you and your, um, your use of language and whether you had any differences between the, the university students and the, and, the school, and the students at school and so on. And okay, you mean myself as an individual Kenyan speaker or as the researcher? Well, I mean you were both. In uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's, 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 uh -huh. that, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah because I, when I'm in Kenya I wear two hats, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm an ordinary person, honestly, and I can flip around between all those you know, ways of speaking with great ease. Yeah. I mean, my Sheng, you know, obviously some of the new ones, I'm yeah. not very much into it, I don't know very well, but I can inter interact with the young Sheng speakers with a fair amount of ease, yeah? Um, Swahili, same thing, and, and English as so. Well. So, I think, um, I don't think they looked very much to, to, at me as, um, in, in, in terms of, you know, what is my position in that scheme of things, okay? Uh, of course, they would see me as uh, slightly, I'm always a little bit an outsider, of course, in that particular group, because obviously they can see I'm driving a car, I'm not really living around with them, you know, I speak good English, I'm a university lecturer, so I'm not exactly, you know, uh, on their path. But um, I don't think uh, uh, there was any negative attitudes towards mm -hmm. my presence there. Yeah. I don't know if that's what. Uh, yeah, mean. I mean that's that's part of it, but also what do you what do you think could have influenced the the oh. results? In oh, I see. How? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult yeah. Thing to answer. It's very difficult. And I, yeah. yeah. And the only way I can avoid that is by not doing the research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it's a, it's a tough one, and I, I think I think you're referring to uh, maybe I skip that. But um, the, the observer's paradox. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The more you want to observe language, the less people behave normally. Yes. Okay. So what do you do? We use the, all different kinds of techniques, okay? And one of them is, uh, as you know, with Laboff's work, is, uh, which I use quite a lot, the danger of death. Have you heard of this thing? So if you want to get the vernacular, the most natural speech, excite people, make them either angry, afraid, no, 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 no. And one of the things, the best things, I, I've done it with my research is to ask them, can you describe the day you nearly died? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Character and Kenya, sorry to say, but they are quite a lot, especially in Nairobi. And I got these horrendous stories of holdups and you know, gangsterism and car accidents. And definitely, the natural voice now comes out mm. the breathy part of it, the excitement, the intonation changes, the real shame comes through because they need to explain to themselves well. So, we use this kind of yeah, techniques. Other things, as you again in your field methods, you may have learned that. Um, uh, um, when you do a recording, ignore the first five minutes. Don't pay attention too much. Yeah? Because the people are still a bit you know, stiff. They're still, you know, they have not relaxed enough. So don't pay too much attention to that. Yeah? You know, break it down so that eventually they, they, can, they, they can bring up the, the vernacular. Because linguists, we are always looking for the vernacular. Which means the language that one speaks when they're most relaxed or their most natural self. Yeah. If you, yeah, uh, it, it, yeah it, if you want to you know, research on English language, you don't come to university classroom to talk about it, yeah. you go somewhere else. Yeah. So there, there are different ways to mitigate that because the observer's paradox is it's always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Do people ever identify you as Kikuyu? Uh, yes, my name is too obvious <laughs> and I don't hide it, yeah. Because Chega is a very common Kikuyu name. Okay. And um, uh, some people go about it by using their Christian names instead, you know, and it's very common, very unfortunate, because 
one of the, <coughs> the reasons I'm doing this work and I'm very interested in this is because Kenya is very ethnically divided, yeah? And as you know, we've been having political problems even, yeah? Based on ethnicity. And so it's always something that you carry around with you and you can't really drop it, yeah? Uh, you, as I said, you can try to use a Christian name so people don't really identify. But as you have seen, it's not just the voice, even the look, they will just, people make judgments about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how, uh, yeah, a bit not very good, but, yeah. but yes, they do, yeah. Um, do you plan on playing the same recordings to speakers with different linguistic background, like uh, of the minority languages, or maybe if uh, the Swahili is spoken in, in the neighboring countries? Or would that be ethically difficult? Ethically, I'm not sure if it's, uh, how do you see, what, what do you see? As you said, there, there are many divides, would there be too much looking for stereotypes to, mm -hmm. yeah. to which, uh, forcing it? Forcing it, yeah. Yes, because some people might react actually negatively, say, oh, you know, you're making fun of our language. That, that I always anticipated that, but happily, with about 152 people, I never got that, at least not in an overt way. But I sort of always kept half expecting to be challenged. Uh, I, and I can see, you know, more or less, some people say, well, you know, this is stereotyping. Uh, but that's not my aim, of course, yeah. Now, um, about expanding it further, now, the, the, the main reason I may not do that immediately or in the near future is because this study focuses on Nairobi, actually. So, uh, because Kenya is, you know, is quite big and diverse, I would have a bit of time you know, going. So I'm looking at Nairobi because it's a microcosm of the country and all speakers are found there. As you can see, it's actually somewhat advantageous in the sense that I'm actually including what are nationally regarded as minorities, Somali and Maasai, but in the city of Nairobi, they actually are not minority. So they actually, it, it, it works out a bit better that way. Yeah. But for now, I'm sticking to Nairobi and maybe the, the surrounding areas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm um, doing something very, very similar in India, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in what you say at the end about how um, Kenya varieties of English are gaining acceptability. Mm -hmm. um, if I am not wrong, you had just the one English variety in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was um, a very standardized English variety because it came from that magazine, other uh, newspaper that you yeah, well, my tra our translation of it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but did you consider at all including more basilectal varieties of English? Um, mm -hmm. Because obviously, when the English that you used, if you were to see that on paper, um, there's not really anything within that that could identify that as a Kenyan speaker. Oh no, but they're not looking at it on paper. No, no, exactly. Yeah. What I'm saying is, um, did you not? Did you consider, or would you consider, perhaps um, including another variety of English, which? was perhaps uh -huh. maybe less intelligible less to intelligible. Uh, somebody who was not familiar with Kenyan English, for example, or something a bit more vernacularized mm -hmm. English. Right, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the closer I, maybe I would go there is vernacularize the English using one of the Kenyan mm. background, because there isn't really, in Kenya, we, it's hard to talk of a, of a, of a basilector or acrolector. Well, you can talk of the acrolector variety of English, but because it's, English in Kenya does not really exist on a continuum as, let's say, in, in the Caribbean. Right. It's really one or the other. Okay. And, and the Kenyan English is it's only, it, the, the difference is that they are influenced by different mother tongues. So the pronunciations and so forth will come through in that way. So um, I, I would, the, the furthest I would go in that direction, which is interesting, is maybe another way of speaking in Kenya. This one that I got was what myself and the, and the professional artist thought is the, the regular run-of-the-mill kind of Kenyan way of, you know, yeah, it's a bit, quite vague, you know, but basically someone who has done you know, some secondary school, that's our definition. Someone who has done up until GCSEs can speak English competently in Kenya. And that's the standard, more or less, that we're using. Yeah. But it would be interesting to see. Now, the, the, you know, in Shang, you, the, the, there's a lot of transatlantic influence, you know, particularly from the global black culture, you know, of hip hop and reggae and so forth. They might recognize a bit of that, but most of them wouldn't understand. I don't think they would understand any kind of, say, a select or Caribbean dialect of English or American English for that matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
that was very interesting. And also, I came here for this talk was um, also because I tried this uh, test for my PhD okay. when I did my field work. Mm -hmm. I failed twice, so I couldn't use it. And I was wondering, you because you also mentioned some people could, some people suspected if the speakers were actually the same person. Mm -hmm. Did anyone come to you to ask? And how did you answer if they came to you? To ask me about if they were the same person. Not directly, no. Okay. But I, I do recall uh, at least one or two instances, two instances actually, where some of the, one of the kids says, "Is that the same guy?" <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 so I didn't press it, you know. I, you know, I sort of, you know, stayed away from. It. And then uh, I think some of the other grown-ups uh, I, I, I interviewed, they had an idea of, 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 of that, but I sort of. Um, uh, use my, uh, my my research privilege to sort of you know keep it you know keep it yeah because I know if we now got into discussing oh that's not real that's not real now the other alternative I had by the way which I considered very carefully was to record natural speech samples from the television or from the radio yeah okay and there are plenty and I kept feeling tempted you know when they're doing interviews on the on the TV I could just get a recording and say what do you think that is or what yeah the problem with that is that for the for this test to work, you need the same text. Yeah, and so now if you if you get this recording of this person saying this, you, you obviously you can't get a similar one in another language somewhere else. So, but I I don't know um, because all this all the studies I have looked at, they all must use the same voice, the voice, the same in, places. In your study, yeah. uh, this was my parent question. Mm -hmm. you, you ask the same guy, the journalist, to recall the same text with these ten different ways of speaking, yes, right? Yes. Don't you think this is a limitation? It is a limitation. Yeah. But in, in a way, uh, the stereotypes that the hearers heard may have been conveyed first by the speaker. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. could, could be, possibly. If you ask him to talk with, to talk shame, for instance, yeah. or to talk uh, with the rural accent, accent mm -hmm. You must have an idea of how he we, to speak with a new accent and in his own way, you know. Uh, and that's the whole point that he, like most Kenyans, know how uh, a Luo uh, uh, right. uh, uh, accented Swahili sounds and know how to imitate. And so I was not, I was not really looking at um, whether it's a good, you know, imitation of this language or that. No, I'm looking at the views behind right. that. So, so that would not really, would still not. Um, Damage the experiment, yeah. Because um, yeah, it's not the language that I'm interested in. It's the views behind yeah, yeah. that, yeah. And so yeah, whether you realize that it's a fake voice, also the same back to that, it doesn't really matter. The idea is that you understand that that's supposed to be a, a low speaker. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you play the the different um, languages in the same order, the varieties in the same order each time, or did you swap which one they had first? A good question. With the groups, I, I swapped the, the order, precisely so that to avoid the monotony as well, and also to avoid uh, being repetitious with the same, you know. Although the groups were isolated, I would have them in a, one classroom in a little corner, or some other private room, only the five of them, and then the others would come. Uh, rearranging them was partly also for me to, to, to you know, I was getting very, you know, <laughs> listening to the same thing, you know, with, you know, five groups of 20 people. So that was the only main reason. I don't know what you had in mind. Yeah, so if you say you are uh, people speak are listening and the first one you hear is Masai, then you're not going to understand or assume that it's talking about the rent situation. Do you think they would have enough knowledge to understand what the meaning behind the voice is if they weren't a speaker of that variety? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they, as I said, they, they, and one of the things I noticed all the time was whenever one of the respondents identified their language, in the, they would start smiling. So there was uh, even the speaker themselves recognized that. Yeah, when the the, the, the Somali kid heard the Somali accented voice, uh, just oh yeah. You know, and one interesting comment uh, one of them made was, oh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. you for having us there. That's, that's very interesting. You know, all this. Because as I said before, the smaller uh, uh, the minority groups, I think, are used to being ignored. But this time they are in the experiment, and that <coughs> actually worked out very well. Yeah. 
I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, so is it when you have the Maasai, is that so you the Maasai accent? Yeah. And does it have Maasai words or is it just... No, 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 no. It's, it's, no, it's just it's Swahili yeah. spoken as if the guy is Maasai. Yeah. So, so everyone would understand? Oh yeah, everybody understands the same, it's the same text, the one I showed you here, repeated 10 different ways by this same speaker. And, and, and the, 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 the lack of other variables in this experiment, other than the voice, is very important. Because that's what makes the experiment, you know, effective. If you change around everything else, then it might be a fact. Yeah? Some people have tried, for example, using different speakers. But then now, there's a, there's a danger of people reacting to the voice, the particular individual's voice, rather than the content of what they're saying. So it's still advisable to use the same, at least the, the ones that have seen the same voices. Yeah. Hmm? Well, unless there's a burning question, no, it comes in the hand. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, this is part of an ongoing project, so if you have any feedback, in addition to those questions, I'll be quite happy to that. Yeah.